I'm in Moscow, capital of Russia, one of the fastest growing economies in the world. To meet with a deeply disturbing gang who not only advocate extreme violence, but also have worrying political ambitions. We are training people for street fighting, not for sports competitions. They are combat wounds. Scars are decoration for a fist. I saw Hitler on TV. Oh, he's so cute. Oh my god. It's like, oh! Steal! Come to Russia, a country where the extreme right are on the rise. Violent attacks on immigrants by neo-Nazi gangs happen every day. It staggers me that in a country who lost millions of people to the Nazis during World War II, that these gangs exist. So I've come here to find out why. My journey begins in my hotel room. I know these gangs have a presence on the internet. Disturbingly, it doesn't take me long to find skinhead sites showing videos of their racist attacks. They've obviously been trained to do it, how to fight in a uh, street fight. They've actually been trained to go out and kick people in the head and do it properly. But the skinheads are notoriously hard to track down. I'm hoping that the more official neo-Nazi websites might provide me with a way in. One group stands out. It calls itself the National Socialist Society. It seems highly organized and is run by a man called Dmitry Rumiantsev. While this Nazi gang aren't stupid enough to admit responsibility for racist attacks, I know they have direct links with the skinheads and suspect they provide them with combat training. Dmitry agrees to meet me at a private gym that the NSO are leasing in an old Soviet office block. Dmitry is in charge of ideology and is effectively the PR man for the Nazi gang. Ross. Dmitry, you tell me a little bit about your organization, please. We train the people who will take part in momentous events that are going to take place in the future. We train people for combat. The commander of our combat units is Sergei. Sergei Maluta. We train in different ways, here in the gym, also outdoors in the city. We teach different types of combat. You can see for yourself. You know, many of the guys here, I've seen on the website, they look like they might be ex-army. Yes, a lot of our guys are ex-soldiers. Some are officers. Sergei fought with the Serbs in Kosovo. I can see how disenfranchised ex-soldiers might be attracted by the military hierarchy, physical training, and even their ideology. 
And so people have to pay sometimes for the training, is that correct? No, it's free. It's free, is it? As long as you join, you're a member of the organization. Sometimes skinheads come and train with us and train for free. We don't ask them their name. If they say they agree with our aims, they can come training with us. How do skinheads differ, in fact, from your organization? Then? We understand that street violence alone doesn't solve problems. When a person understands that, he leaves the skinheads and comes to us. Well, that was day one. We spent an afternoon and evening with the National Socialists. Um, I think they're quite a scary organization. They seem to have lots of money. They're incredibly well organized and they seem very determined. I want to find out more about this gang, so I persuade Dmitri to let me join their regular weekend training session. We're here with Dmitri and the rest of the NSO boys. Um, we're in a suburb north of Moscow and um, I'm about to start my day's training in the building behind me, which was going to be a hospital. I think the money ran out. Now it's become an NSO urban training ground. So here we go. How are you doing? I've no idea what I'm letting myself in for, but I get the feeling they'll be putting me to the test. The first surprise is one of their recruits. Not everyone here is ex-army or a skinhead. She seems to be with them. I'm not sure about her urban camouflage, though. Look at this lot over to... Up there. Up, pan up. Pan up. Pan up now. Just taking our time. According to Dmitri, the number of gang members is growing, and there is a queue of new Nazis waiting to join. WP, white power, spelled in English. I have to say it is incredibly hot, but Sergei, the short guy is in charge of the military wing, he's definitely never heard of deodorant. myself running around a building site with a load of neo-Nazis in Moscow wearing camouflage. There's a gas tube inside the magazine there. Yeah. And then here a load is kind of steel ball bearings. And obviously the gas behind it projects the balls. <laughs> So we go. It hurts. Is it loaded? There? I see if I can shoot it. Yeah, cam. And again. The ball bearings are small but they go right through the bottle. Yeah, he's making his point. These guys aren't messing around. They've just done a 5K run with 30 kilos of bricks on their backs. It seems I've signed up for more than I bargained for. Combat Commander Sergei did warn me that the training would be a test of character. I decided to go without the rucksack on the basis that they're all half my age and they've been doing it for a little longer than me. And I'm caught completely off guard when I have to launch myself into freezing snow melt. 
I'm hoping if I make it through these tests, I will win Dimitri's trust and then be able to find out exactly what they're training for. So I have to say, uh, training with an arse is quite an interesting experience. Um, completely unsafe. I mean, we run around around the woods in direct sunlight and turn a corner into a cellar for the entire building, which has got staircases in it. You drop like the height of me plus. So two of them missed the foot and went straight down. Like you're running in complete darkness for a good 250 meters, where there are concrete wire posts sticking out of the ground, holes in the ground like this. Look. Look at it. I'm surprised <laughs> any of them want to go around again. The Nazi recruit I'm most intrigued by is Sasha, a 20-year-old economic student from a wealthy family. Her brother introduced her to the gang. I can't help but wonder why she's here. To find out, I have to wait until she finishes her shootout exercise they call the duel. Armed with one of the gas-powered guns, Sasha's task is to fire as many ball bearings at her opponent as possible. Their only protective gear seems to be an extra layer of clothing and some ski goggles. Ну что, ваши готовы? Маш. На счёт 3 работаем. Раз. Два. Три. Работаем. Разошлись. Что у тебя произошло? Ну это ты поставил до предохранителя. Я тебе давал сотку со снято. Ладно, кто нибудь Артем еще в пару, потому что это, конечно, было. Do you think that training is ever going to come in handy in the future? Безусловно, я не могу. I'm sure this training will be useful. Of course, I don't know what's going to happen in the future in this country. But the situation is unstable. And this is why survival skills will be very important. Um, and would you, would you take arms to defend Russia? Yes, of course. You answer that very, very... Positively. Have you envisaged what might happen? I think a civil war may break out. Between who? Between the people who realize the country is in a critical situation and the people who don't care, who want to ignore it. Disturbingly, Sasha seems to have swallowed Dmitri's propaganda without question, although her definition of the enemy remains pretty abstract. Now it's my turn. Although for my benefit, it appears the stakes are about to be raised. And you have to pull the weapon out and cock it, yeah? Yeah. 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 Готов? 
два, три! This is the most extreme test I've ever had in order to gain access to a game. Boys, there's no ammunition in my gun. Artyom, uh, thank you very much for shooting me in the finger. I have a little memory. Can you tell me what's the purpose of that? Why do you set fire and why do you shoot at each other like that? We're training to be ready for the moment when we will need to defend not only our motherland but our people. Sooner or later that time will come and we will have to take arms and prove that we are men. And, and, and who will you be taking arms against, you think? The most likely enemy is the Islamists, the Muslims, the people who may come to our land. But there are many enemies. Are you not using the fact that you get people excited by abseiling and by shooting and setting fire to them and getting young people to come to you and then selling them an ideology? No. We train only those people who come to us with firm convictions. We don't accept any stowaways, so to speak. Do you have a regular job and you, do you do this at the weekends? Yes, of course. I'm an engineer in a small private firm. And would, would your bosses be upset if they knew that you were in the NSO and that you came and did this at the weekends? I don't think my employers care. As long as I work efficiently and meet the deadlines, they don't mind. What would happen if um, a Muslim came to try and join the group? We haven't had anyone like that try to join. It's hard to tell, but it's unlikely we would accept one. But they don't come. In one way you could say, oh, it was a nice day out of bonding. Or in the other way you could say it was, this is the way they get these people to do things for them. And it was very clear that there were people like Dimitri sitting in the background who wasn't particularly getting his hands dirty, he didn't get himself set on fire or didn't end up up to his neck in freezing cold water, who were pulling the strings. And um, for me, we, well, I don't know totally what's going on here, but I'm uh, beginning to think that there is something very ugly underneath all this kind of bonhomie and camaraderie. Um, I do hope today though that um, from me getting involved in some way we've, uh, we've won their trust. So I have to stand there like this with this lot? I also okay, think one, one, one. that they think that they're using us in some way as some sort of propaganda for them. We're at the stage where we're not quite sure who's using who right now. So far, Dimitri and his gang have admitted to training for a future war against immigrants. But tomorrow, I'm going to meet some of the people who live with the reality of daily racist attacks. I'm in Russia on the trail of a neo-Nazi gang I suspect is behind a growing number of attacks on immigrants. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, former republics like Tajikistan, Azerbaijan and Armenia suddenly became countries in their own right, and their citizens are now viewed as foreigners by most Russians. Many immigrants find work in markets such as this. These are the people the Nazi gangs see as the enemy. If you uh, look at the faces of most of these people here, if you look at the colour of their skin, these people would be referred to as blacks by the NSO and the neo-Nazis. 
Most of them are Azeris, Tajiks. And what the Russians are saying is they've been pushed out of the marketplace by these people. The people that you can't see who are standing behind us are the owners of the market, and they are Russians. And all the policemen and all the security here are all Russians. So these people may be uh, stealing other people's job, but the people in control still are the white Russians. According to recent estimates, a third of Moscow's population are immigrants. And while the government has stated that they need more immigrant workers to keep the economy afloat, it's doing little, if anything, to prevent racist attacks. Many of these crimes occur openly on public transport. Only recently, a gang shouting glory to Russia attacked an Armenian teenager, Arta Sartayan. Arta didn't survive. This is the, the train that Arta took home every night from work. It was only two stations away from home, Pushkin Station, and these guys got on the train and changed his life and his family's life forever. In the early 90s, Arta's parents, Edik and Irina, fled the anti-Armenian pogroms in Azerbaijan and came to Moscow hoping for a better life. Instead, they lost their son. Despite fearing for their own safety, they've agreed to talk to me. The investigator told me that there were two attackers, but near the entrance door to the carriage was one more, the third one, who was watching. It sounded as though it was an organized group. He was such a skinny boy. He had a very thin neck. What was there to cut up? But they stabbed him six times in the neck. What for? Why was my son, whom I raised, to whom I gave all my love, all my tenderness, why did this non-human kill my son? A real man would never attack from behind. Only traitors, only weaklings do it. A strong person would never behave like that. People who hide them are also weak people. They teach to attack secretly. They never say things to his face. They are rats. They are cowards. The authorities define this as a racially motivated crime. However, as yet, nobody has been charged and the case is gathering dust. Irina now refuses to let a surviving son take public transport. But every day, she has to take the train on which the attack took place to work. Now all she wants is to leave Russia, a country she hoped would be their haven. The next morning, Dmitri, leader of the Nazi gang, has arranged an interview. While they will not admit responsibility for racist attacks, they seem strangely proud of an apparent work of fiction. And I'm to meet the author. Dmitri, how are you? 
Здравствуй, Рос. Это Дмитрий, автор книги, которую я тебе давал. Я надеюсь, вы найдете общий язык. Все. Спасибо. До свидания. Although this account purports to be fictional, the author refuses to show his face on camera. And he has admitted to me that the account is based on his personal experiences as a skinhead. This may be the closest I get to a confession. He reads me an excerpt. In the next carriage, the skinhead stood by the door. Watch the communication cord. Don't attack altogether. The immigrant woke up and saw that he was surrounded by angry skinheads. He looked around in desperation. Twice the immigrant tried to get to his feet, but the skinheads pushed him down. The skinheads were removing their belts and chains. The air was electrified with calm and calculated hatred. There was nothing left for him to do but to await the execution. There was a countdown in everyone's head. Four, three, two, one. Let's go. Why the fuck did you come here? Bitch. Die. Die. Having arrived home, they phoned one another to ask if everyone arrived safely. At three o'clock in the morning, they were asleep, with a sense that they had thoroughly fulfilled their duty. I had to listen to this disgusting rambling for over an hour, and he seems pretty proud of the effect that the book is having on the far right. Since the time the book was written, the movement has made a step forward. Now, if you look at the statistics, victims are not just beaten up, they're stabbed to death. So it's not surprising that immigrants are terrified at the thought of leaving their homes and coming face to face with a bunch of these thugs. You would hope they could turn to the police for help. However, in Moscow, that isn't the case. I'm just about to meet a lady called Gavhar. She's from Tajikistan, one of the poorest of the former Soviet Socialist Republics. She's basically the only ray of hope for many illegal immigrants here that have race hate crimes committed against them. And her work is so sensitive that we're not allowed to film her in her office. So we're going to have to meet her at her house. Gavar deals with almost 100 cases of racial abuse and attacks every year. She struggles to even get the authorities to take notice, and getting the cases to court is even harder. Convictions are extremely rare. Ross. Gavar, very nice. Very nice. I'm to remember where But it's not just racist gangs that Gavar is fighting. Disturbingly, several of her cases also involve the police. Love cats, very good. Please. Thank you. Спасибо. Добро пожаловать. Welcome. Wasn't there an incident once where a girl was being kidnapped and she rang you? Yes, a Tajik girl was put in a car by some drunken policemen. They were on the way to the forest, probably so she could be raped. But the police failed to notice she had a mobile phone. She called me and said, I'm being taken somewhere, but not to the police station. 
So we told her what to do. She said to them, I just called my lawyer. They know I'm here. So then they changed their minds and took her to the police station. How do the police get money illegally from immigrants? Dishonest policemen have worked out all sorts of ways to make money. A local policeman can charge a worker 500 rubles a month to stay in a flat or for false registration to live in Moscow or to prevent you from being locked up. In the worst case, they threaten to fit you up for something, like planting drugs in your pocket. The police have worked out all sorts of ways to make big money. I'm not surprised that most of Gavar's clients have refused to talk to me. But I'm on my way to meet one Tajik immigrant, Rustam, who stood up to the police and has agreed to speak to me. Rustam's problems all started after a night out with a friend. He was keen to get home. A policeman asked him for his papers. When Rustam said he didn't have any, the policeman took him to a special police room they have in all the tube stations. It was there the policeman asked Rustam for a bribe of 20 pounds. When Rustam said he didn't have any money, the policeman said, you know, I can kill you. He took the safety catch off and aimed the pistol at me and opened fire from a distance of one and a half meters. He was aiming at my forehead, but I turned my head a little and the bullet hit me in the mouth. The bullet went into his jaw and took out a tooth. It then traveled down his neck and lodged in his shoulder. I could see my reflection in the mirror. There was blood everywhere. My friend picked me up and started shouting at the policeman. I said, call an ambulance for me. The policeman replied, you go into the street and use a public phone if you want an ambulance. With Gavar's help, Rostam got a lawyer and after a year-long battle, the case eventually came to court. Amazingly, the policeman was found guilty and sentenced to nine years. They wouldn't have done it to a white Russian, nor to a Muscovite. But when they see black people, Tajiks, Uzbeks, they start to torment us. After the policeman was sentenced, did you ever experience any trouble with the police? Occasionally I still get stopped, but I'm registered to live here. Police ask, what are you doing in Moscow? I once said you can deport me if you like. I'm fed up with Moscow. The police already shot me once, so deport me. I'd be better off back at home. With police attitudes like this, it's no wonder that Dmitry's gang think they're above the law. The Russian government claims it sorely needs more workers to save its economy. Meanwhile, Dmitry's Nazi gang keep openly recruiting and training Russians in preparation for a war against the very immigrants their country's future depends on. Tonight is kind of martial arts night, or, um, you know, teaching each other how to kick people in the head. Let's go meet them then. As I walk over, 
Dimitri is once again on the sidelines. They are practicing street fighting. We are training people for street fighting, not for sports competitions. And even delicate girls like this are learning to fight. That is why of all the political organizations, we are the most feared. We bring fear to the streets. Then Dmitri tells me about his absurd vision for Russia's future. When we take power, the first thing to do is to arrest all the corrupt officials and decide the fate of each of them. We will then have to put in their place young guys who are now fighting in the streets and have no experience of government. Of course, it won't be easy. Second priority is to get rid of all the immigrants. They need to be put in camps and prisons, like the corrupt officials. So that was Dimitri's views. Um, I mean, they're all based on, on Mein Kampf and Hitler's rise to power. He's got these kids running around for him like his little Hitler youth. Um, he's advocating putting people uh, on trains and sending them off to camps, people that he doesn't like. Uh, he's also going to replace the Duma with those kids. They're all going to be the ministers for uh, foreign affairs, the Minister for Education, the Minister for Agriculture. Can't wait to see what happens when they get in charge. Um, the frightening thing is that, you know, I don't believe for one second any of this is ever going to happen. But the fact that he has a following here and the fact that he believes so vehemently in everything that he says makes him a rather scary human being. Even more frightening is the fact that no one is speaking out against Dimitri and his gang. And unlike any other gang I've visited around the world, they actually have their supporters in the Russian parliament, the Duma. Says, I am a Russian. Nikolai Kurianovich, the most outspoken of the far-right politicians, has agreed to meet me. He tells me he's a big fan of both Hitler and Stalin, which is a bit confusing. Maybe any dictator will do. I have read some of the books written by the leaders of the Third Reich. I have seen films. I like their spirituality, the unity of the nation, the imperial power. And he has a barbaric solution as to how to save the Russian economy. Migrant workers need to be used as cheap labor, a form of mild slavery. They shouldn't be allowed to become Russian citizens. They have to work, pay their taxes, and go home. So, Mr. Kurianovich, a man that advocates public hangings, mild forms of slavery, whatever that means, uh, ethnic cleansing, I mean, one of the things that he advocates is the removal of passports from white Russian women who go out with what he calls blacks. The worrying thing is he has quite a strong support. People quite like what he says. Tomorrow is my last day. Dmitri has agreed to take me to their secret training camp on the outskirts of the city. It's my final chance to really get to the bottom of the sinister reality behind this gang.
It's my last day in Moscow, where after two weeks, I have finally been accepted into the heart of the neo-Nazi gang. I'm about to be taken to their secret headquarters on the outskirts of the city. What is Sasha? There's a surreal atmosphere. I feel like I could be in Germany in 1933, preparing to go on a picnic with a young Adolf Hitler and Ava Braun. While I've declined to have a kick around, I'm sticking with it, as this could be my chance to reveal the truth behind this gang. We're just about to go to the NSO headquarters. It's a two-hour drive um, out of Moscow, and they've requested that we're all blindfolded for the journey in case we reveal its location. I'm not sure who's more nervous, Elena, the interpreter, or me. Mobile. Telephone. Рос, подвиньтесь, да, скажите это самое. Можете понюхать. Я нюхаю, что чисто. О, стерильная. Так, Вперед. Давай. Давайте. А, вот у меня телефон. Obviously, um, I have a balaclava on my head. And um, the lady next to me is Elena, our translator. She has a balaclava on her head. And it wouldn't take the most brightest person to work out. The cameraman possibly hasn't got a balaclava on his head. And, you know, we haven't got cuffs on, so we could look out the window. But we're obviously doing this to gain their trust so we could go there and film this, this base. It's good to be here, not on my own, but <laughs> in company. You think you're safe with me? Ross, oh yes, sure, Ross. <laughs> I can't say this is the most enjoyable trip I've ever been on. We have no idea where we're going. They've taken away our only means of communication and our balaclavas stink. After a two hour drive, we finally arrive at their secret dacha. I think we're here, and I think we can take our masks, or well, masks, our balaclavas off, or whatever they are. It's obvious that Dimitri hasn't completely relaxed his guard yet, and he immediately decides who I can and can't meet. I'm told to take my shoes off. They go for all of us, I believe. And having established Nazis like clean carpets, they then take me on an interminable tour of the house. Алексей, ты на микрофон работай. When I get outside, the garden party is in full swing. It's a strange mix of shaven-headed thugs and impressionable young girls. 16-year-old Katie went to a prestigious American school in Moscow and is now the gang's web illustrator. Two years ago, at 14, I turned 
But what was the spurring moment when you were 14 to want to become a... Uh... I saw Hitler on TV. And how oh, he's so cute, oh my god. It's like, oh. But he's dead. He's not real anymore. There's something like Mickey Mouse or like uh, Santa Claus or Superman for us. Katie's also a budding journalist who enjoys writing for Nazi publications. Now I'm writing a column at McDonald's. So McDonald's with two Aryan food. There's two Aryan food? Yeah. Of course. Why course? Well, just a joke. It's funny. Oh, just a joke. Oh, well, we like it. A shutka. Glamour. Some of the people here have, have gone out and beaten black people up. I know, I used to do that for one month. You went out and beat people up? Well, when I come first, I, mean, I, I, I should, I should, was like, like, what, him. what happened then? Well, I killed one man. You killed a bloke, yeah? Yeah. And how did you do that? With a knife. But I'm not doing that anymore. I just used, I, I had to. Why did you have to? Well, because they, like, make friends with all those people and stuff. Sorry? To make friends and stuff. Well, just feel how it feels like. I don't like killing. It's not funny. But I think the robots will kill all the humanity and we'll all die. All right. Like in the movies? Yeah. Katie seems to be trying to shock me, and it's difficult to take anything she says seriously. But I have no doubts about this man's credibility. Tezak, whose name means hatchet in Russian, is a fully-fledged member of a skinhead gang. These are the people I've been wanting to meet. Ross. Schulz. You've got some nice knives there. Can I have a look at your, your knife? Yes. It's a Russian bear, huh? Yeah. It's a steel bone. What happened to your knee? <coughs> I hurt it a little. Things happen. Our life is hard. It's dangerous on the street. Immigrants attack people. They're combat wounds. Scars are decoration for a fist. It's beautiful to have a scar. When you say uh, say combat wounds, what kind of combat are they from? From fights with the blacks. In a fight, you don't always notice immediately that your enemy has a weapon, especially when it's dark. Then you just feel the blood running from your arm. But what can you do? In the desert, there are aggressive wild animals. You have to hunt them. If you don't, they attack the peaceful population. That's it. If you kill one, a thousand immigrants won't come. Tezak shares some of Dmitri's warped logic and believes that terror against immigrants is for their benefit. When they come here, they suffer from eating the wrong food. They try to sell things. But people here don't like them. People are always trying to kill them or humiliate them. Tezak says he became a racist after Chechen rebels supposedly blew up several blocks of flats in 1999. In the first block of flats lived a girl whom I knew. I said, let's go and kill Chechens. I took a knife and decided I would kill a Chechen. So I saw some guys with clubs and they saw me with a knife. They felt my mood and they said, come with us. We went to a market and punished some Chechens for the crime committed by their compatriots. Tezak has confirmed what I suspected all along, that this neo-Nazi gang is harboring racist murderers. Meanwhile, 
Katie tries to catch my attention again. You want to see some movies? Yeah, sure. They made those movies, those guys, to suck. We go inside in order to see Katie's screen properly. The Nazi gang have made huge efforts to give the impression that violence is what they're all about. It's obviously difficult for people to talk about crimes with which they haven't been charged. It turns out that Tezak made those videos I saw in my hotel room at the beginning of my journey. And there are far more disturbing ones to come. But anyway, it's propaganda, isn't it? Yes, of course it's propaganda. It goes without saying. However, some clips are obviously genuine. Blood is going to splash on the wall. Beautiful, isn't it? What do you think of this thing, Dimitri? About which clip? In general, I watch them with pleasure. I like them. A lot of people who want to watch this program, uh, Dimitri, are going to be very shocked by your opinions and your philosophy. Um, what would you say to those people? <clears throat> I would like the viewers in Europe to remember the bombs in the London Underground and what's happening in Holland, what happened in France and Denmark. If they don't like our philosophy after that, then those people don't deserve being called people. This is the most distasteful gang I've ever met. We still have to keep up the pretense of enjoying their hospitality, as we have no idea where we are or how we're going to get back to Moscow. National socialists and, and skinheads um, dressing up in uniforms, playing soldiers, uh, espousing far-right beliefs may sound like a bit of a joke. But the fact is the far-right are on the rise here and racist attacks are a daily occurrence. There is no doubt that this gang is either directly or indirectly behind racist attacks in Moscow. Their literature and videos alone are inciting other racists to attack defenseless immigrants. According to one estimate, over half the world's skinheads now live in Russia. And that's an awful lot of minds for Dmitry to fill with hate.